Well, I'd like to welcome all of you here on this Memorial Day weekend, a perfect Memorial Day weekend weather. For those of you here in the room, uh, those of you online, uh, if you're from a different part of the country, I hope your weather is better than ours. But it's good to have you with us as uh, not only do we celebrate Memorial Day this weekend, but we also here at Cornwall Church, we wrap up this series we've been in for eight weeks looking at hopeful living, something that we kicked off kind of at Easter and we wrap that up today. <clears throat> as we uh, go into this final week, let me tell you a little bit more about the home that I grew up in. You got a chance to meet my mom a couple of weeks ago, and I've told you about my, uh, my parents, my upbringing over the years. I don't know if I told you this, but as a family, there was a, a, a kind of a ritual, a weekly ritual that we had beside church, another one, not quite as spiritual. But this week, weekly ritual, we would gather together and we would watch, and there was these people that made their way into our homes, into our hearts, into our lives. People like Buck Owens and Roy Clark, <laughs> Grandpa Jones and Minnie Pearl. Lulu Romaine and Junior Samples. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Hee Haw. Yeah, yeah. We, we watch Hee Haw every single week, and so that explains a lot about me. But it, one of the things that would happen every week in Hee Haw is that there was this, this part, this song that they would sing. It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek about how difficult life was, where they would sing, Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Oh, I mean, it was just kind of this, this funny thing. And then they would have, you know, verses that would talk about how horrible life was. And it was a, kind of a joke. It was kind of a, a light way of looking at some of the difficulties of life. But it's not always so fun. It's not always so light. There was a study done by Harvard and uh, written up by the Journal of American uh, Medical Association about five or six years ago. This is pre-COVID. And what was discovered in the this, in this survey or in the uh, study was that for the first time in 100 years, the life expectancy of the average American had actually decreased. For the last 100 years, it had been on an upper, up and to the right trend. But about uh, somewhere between uh, 2018 and 2019, this is pre-COVID, that trend began to go down. And then in, when COVID hit, it, it went down even more. But they identified one of the factors, not the only one, but one of the factors that would cause the, the average lifespan of Americans to decrease of something, and they coined a term, deaths of despair. Deaths of despair. And in this category of deaths of despair would include things like suicide, alcohol and drug-related deaths, and addiction, which are often very much associated with depression, hardship, and stress. And to think of that, that the, there's a whole term of death of despair. To know that we have a God who is the most hopeful being in the entire universe, the God of hope, this is not from him. The enemy wants to come, wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And whether it's to take your life or just to take the quality of your life, this despair and hopelessness is something that we've been addressing for the last eight weeks because God never created or intended for us to live in a state of despair and hopelessness. And the verse that we've been looking at for eight weeks that you have memorized, that you come prepared to say with me, is found in, in Romans chapter 15 where it says, May the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What an incredible verse. And I know many of you have memorized that and I hope that that stays with you for the remainder of your life because that is a truth that you can hold on to. And here's the truth about that, that you can have that overflowing hope no matter who's around you, no matter if your whole family is negative and depressed, no matter if your workplace is filled with despair, no matter if our world is negative, you can still have this overflowing hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And while that is true for each one of us individually, Let me remind you that that was written not to an individual, but it was written to a group of Christ followers in Rome. It was written to a church. It was written to the Roman church, this group, this body. And and as I was researching this yet again this week, it was reminded to me that that word you in that verse is not talking individually as 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 um, as an individual person. It's actually talking plural to this church, to this followers of Christ. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, okay, I, I, I get where that's going. Depending on what part of the United States you're from, that verse could read quite differently. If you're from the Northeast, it might sound like this. May the God of hope fill you guys. Because that's how they say it in the Northeast. If you're from Appalachian area, if you say Appalachian, you're not from there. But if you're from the Appalachian area, it would say, may the, may the God of hope fill you That's what they say there, the you I was born in Louisiana. In the deep south, it's y'all. May the God of hope fill y'all with all joy and peace. As y'all trust in him. Now, him is not a one-syllable word. (laughs) Him. As y'all trust in him, that y'all may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not Holy Spirit. It's Holy Ghost, and the emphasis is on the first first, uh, syllable. You overflow with hope by, by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what y'all get. You overflow like that gravy bowl right there on Mamaw's table, right next to the collard greens and the fried okra. But it's this idea that this is us. And as Pastor Steve preached about a month or so ago, that we find hope when we're in community. When we're isolated, that's a, that's a certain recipe for despair and hardship. But when we're in community, there's a greater hope. And not only finding hope in community, but we are to be a community of hope so that we can bring hope to the greater community, that we would be this. And what's an incredible verse here in Romans 15 and with this truth, it's so powerful and so positive and actually quite profound that the God of all hope, that the most hopeful being in the entire universe will fill us with these words like all joy, all peace, overflowing with hope. I mean, what's not to like about that? And as profound as it is, sometimes it's misunderstood that if this God, this all hopeful being fills us with all joy and all peace, and we're overflowing with hope, we just come to this conclusion that life must just be easy. Life must be trouble. Tr- tr- m- m- it's going to go really well for us. <laughs> that our life is going to be fantastic. As the kids would say today, it's going to be busting. This is, life is going to be amazing. And what happens is when it's not When we face hardships, when we face difficulties, when the prayers are unanswered, when the hopes are not fulfilled, we come to this conclusion. Either it's not true, or it doesn't work for me, or it's all true, and it's not working for me because God doesn't like me. And this is what I want to address today. How we can continue to have this overflowing hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, even in those difficult times, hope in the troublesome reality of life. Hope when life does not adjust itself to the things that we hope for. Hope when life is difficult. Hope when we're never able to have children. Hope when children bring about a great deal of pain or disappointment. Hope when we never got married. Hope when the marriage is not what we had hoped it would be. Hope when we didn't get the job or into the school. Hope when the diagnosis is not good. Hope when the disease is not healed. Hope when the prayers are not answered. Hope when life does not adjust itself to the things that we hope for. That's what I want to talk about today, especially as we finish out this series. In the first week, I referenced some individuals who were able to maintain and hold on to an unswerving hope even in the midst of dire, difficult situations. People throughout history, people like Nelson Mandela and and, and Desmond Tutu in in, uh, Robben Island in in the uh, incarceration during apartheid, 
Or people in POW camps like Viktor Frankl or Louis Zamperini or Admiral James Stockdale. That in the most horrible, deplorable conditions and situations with no seeming hope on the horizon at all, they were able to hold on to hope. What was it about them? A little side note, uh, and if we had another week in this series, I would probably preach on this one. Out of Zechariah, there's this little phrase where Zechariah refers to prisoners of hope. I wish I had time to go into all that, but it's like these guys were prisoners, but they were prisoners of hope. They still had hope. Not only were they prisoners in this situation, but there was something that gripped and would not release their heart. It was this hope. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the life of an individual who experienced for his entire life difficulties, hardships, disappointments, unfulfilled hopes, uh, unanswered prayers, expectations that were not ever met to what he held on to. And yet, at the end of it and in the middle of it, he writes this four-verse, we're going to look at this four-verse diamond, this, this pure gold piece of four verses that bring hope. And it's so key for him and it's so key for us that these four verses, I think, are the most important for us to land this whole series on as we enter the last week of it. Now, I will say this. It's going to take a while to get to those four verses, just to warn you, because some of you, you're hoping it's a short sermon. Not so. This is hope in troublesome realities. Okay. It's going to take us a minute to get to those, not a literal minute. It's going to take us a while to get to those four verses, because I really want to talk about this individual's life so that you understand how difficult his life was, how Hopeless it seemed, how disappointing it was that he has somehow earned the right to be able to say these words. He's not sitting around in a perfect world and throwing out little platitudes for us. He's gone through it. So the person we're going to look at today is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, not the bullfrog, the prophet. Jeremiah, for some of us, when we hear the word Jeremiah, the name Jeremiah, our minds immediately go to Jeremiah 29, 11. Great place to go. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, give you hope in the future, all that thing. It was a great, great verse. Sometimes we hear Jeremiah and our minds go to Jeremiah 31, 3, where God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. An incredible verse. Or maybe if we've actually studied Jeremiah or read through the book, maybe we remember chapter 18 where he goes to the potter's house and he sees this, this example of how God wants to shape and mold him and, and Israel and all those things. And maybe you're aware that Jeremiah was hand-selected by God. He was chosen by God. He was called by God for a very noble purpose. In all of these things, you begin to see that Jeremiah had, had all this going on for him. And so it would be real easy to come to this conclusion that with all of this, that, that God has called him, that his life must be great. Most scholars believe that he was about 21 years old when he got the call from God that he would be a prophet. And this is how he records it in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says this, The word of the Lord came to me. Remember now, he's maybe 21, young, young, young man. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. If you've ever experienced or heard of someone who just so loves what they're doing, they say, this is what I was created for. Jeremiah would have been that one. This is the reason you were created. Before you were ever conceived, I already had a plan for your life. I already had you set apart. I was already going to do this. I already knew this. And not only this, but you were going to be not only a prophet for me, not only a prophet for my people, but this one was rare. He said you would be a prophet for the nations. It was rare that God would send a prophet to anyone other than Israel. Jonah was an exception when he went to Nineveh. But Jeremiah is not going to just be a prophet to Israel, God's chosen people, but to the surrounding nations as well. And Jeremiah pushes back a little and says, whoa, 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 God, I'm, I'm just a young man and I don't even know how to talk. And he says, hush, you know, I, I chose you here and I will put the words in your mouth. And he makes a promise. I will go with you and I will give you the words to speak. And if you read through uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, God paints this picture. He says, Jeremiah, you are going to say the things I tell you to say. And you are going to change the nations. 
there will be the tearing down and the building up, this expectation. And after he gets past this fear, there's this uncertainty, but there's an anticipation, there's an expectation, what God might do through me, that God has created me for this purpose, and what it could do for our nation, what it could do for our world. I mean, you can imagine as a 21-year-old to think, God himself created, chosen, selected me. He's with me. He's given me promises. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to walk in obedience, do everything he says to do, go everywhere he says to go, say everything he says to say. And that's what Jeremiah does. And you would expect in that kind of obedience, with that kind of calling, there would be a life filled with blessing and goodness. Not the case. Jeremiah is obedient, goes where God tells him to go, does what God tells him to do, says what God tells him to say. But professionally, if you want to use that term, as a prophet, he's met with disappointment again and again and again. It's not a lot of fruit that comes from it. People ignore his message. And personally, because of his obedience to God, he experiences a great deal of pain over and over again and a life of hardship and disappointment. See, we don't like to hear that. Because what we like to think is a transactional. If I'm obedient to God, he will bless me. But here Jeremiah is obedient to God all the way through. And it's difficult. I've said this before. The difference between a priest and a prophet. They both bless you. They both stand in the gap. The priest stands in the gap and he speaks to God on people's behalf. A prophet stands in the gap and he speaks to the people on God's behalf. That's where Jeremiah is. He's going to take the words that God gives to him, and he's going to tell them to the people. You'd think this should be fantastic. Look how this plays out. Jeremiah 26. He gives this message. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, he's being obedient. God gave me this word. I gave it there. This wasn't my deal. This is God's. The priests, the prophets... And all the people seized him and said, you must die. Listen, I've preached some bad sermons in my life. You've told me that. I've gotten the emails. I've had you go to Christ the King. I understand all that. But I'm so grateful that never after one of my bad sermons, you got the elders together and the pastors together and say, Pastor Bob, you must die. I'm just grateful that there's at least that much grace in this community, that that's not the response. Now, listen, we're not going to have time to go all the way through Jeremiah's life, but this is just scratching the surface where he's being obedient. He's saying the very words that God says, and he's getting death threats for it. There's another time in chapter 20, and we won't read this, but in chapter 20, where again, he preaches what God tells him to preach. He says what God tells him to say, and they don't like to hear that. So they have him beaten, physically beaten. This is before the days of, of the illegal use of cruel and unusual punishment. He is physically beaten, and then he's put in stocks. And this wasn't just to secure him. The stocks were a, men, a, a torture device, the, the, the contortion of your body and the pain that would come, the cramping and what it would do to your body. So here he is. He's beaten, and he's put in these stocks. So physically, he's taken a pounding force, speaking the truth of God. And not only that, but the socks were meant for public humiliation because it would be out on the street corner. And to add insult to injury, they put these socks outside the gate right where the temple is. And you can imagine, I can imagine, as Jeremiah is there, body in pain, in stocks, publicly humiliated, and he can look through the gates and he can see the temple of God and saying, God, really? Really? This, this is what I get for being obedient? This is what you created me for? Well, what about all that? I'm going to be over the nations and the kingdoms, and they're going to be built and rise up. This is what it is. So in chapter 20, <laughs> he just gives his complaint. Uh, he just says, God, you've deceived me. You lied to me, and I bought it. I mean, the things you said, you deceived me. And he just goes on. I mean, you talk about hardships. In verse 14 of chapter 20, he says this. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. That's, when you're saying, you know what song I want you to sing on my birthday? Cursed birthday to me. Cursed birthday to me. He says, no one should be happy. No one should be celebrating on my birthday. That ought to be a day of, of, of mourning and sorrow. 
He goes on, and you can read this on your own. He says, the man who came out to tell my dad, uh, you've been given, you've, you know, you got a son? They should have slapped him instead of me. That's my paraphrase, but that's what he says. And then he gets really serious. He says, I wish someone would have aborted me. I wish my mother's womb would have been my eternal tomb. In verse 18. He says, why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? And it never gets better. I mean, you fast forward through some years. There's another time, I think it's in chapter 36, where God says to him, I want you to take the words I've given to you and write them on a scroll. And he does, word for word, writes it all out. And then he hands the scroll over. And they take this scroll, his act of obedience, they take this scroll and they tear it up and they burn it. I mean, beside the fact, it's like, man, I got writer's cramp from that. I'm just doing, God, what's that about? They're not even reading what you told me to give them. They're not listening to this. When he was about 60 years old, remember, he was 21 when he's called. So this is almost 40 years of walking in obedience. When he's about 60 years old, Uh, This is what happened. He's falsely accused, as he's going out the city gates, he's falsely accused of going um, and deserting to the Babylonians. Chapter 37, verse 15, says, They were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten. This kind of repeated uh, little scene for him. Had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he remained a long time. So now he's beaten once again because he's falsely accused. And they put him not only in jail, they put him in the dungeon where it's dark, where it's cold, where it's dank. And he's there, it says, for a long time. How long? I don't know. But for them to say it was a long time would have been more than a couple of weeks. Zedekiah was king in those days for nine years. I'm not saying he was in there for nine years, but it's very possible that he was in there for two, three, four, five years. Day after day. Week after week, month after month, year after year, in this dark, cold, smelly dungeon. God, this is what you called me to? However long that long time was, when he finally, finally gets out, he continues to walk in obedience and do what God tells him. The very next chapter, chapter 38, verse 6. So they took Jeremiah... And they put him in the, into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud, and Jeremiah sank down into the mud. A cistern is just a, a big kind of a tank, a cavern cut out of rock where they would store water in the rainy season so they would have it throughout the year. This cistern has not been used for water anymore. In fact, you can kind of get the idea that maybe... They've repurposed it, not to hold fresh water, but to hold refuse. That there's some mud in there, not just a little bit of sediment on the bottom. Mud enough for him to sink into. You can imagine that over the years, this is just kind of where they throw all their garbage. This is where the guards hang out. They're spitting in there and doing all kinds of stuff. Maybe the gray water goes in there after they've taken a bath or washed the dishes or done the laundry. Maybe sewage goes in there, the garbage. You can imagine this this sludge that they're lowering Jeremiah into where he sinks into it and just the, the noxious stench of this cesspool that he's lowered into and the vermin that's all around him and he's stuck in that. The glamorous life of a prophet. On top of all of this, the disappointment and the heart that he has for his people, God's people, who are still in rebellion even though he's brought God's word to them. The frustration of the surrounding nations that he thought he was going to be able to transform with the word of God and they're not listening to him at all. The exile of his people into Babylon The personal frustration of, I've spent my whole life doing this. And the physical pain that he goes through. Are are you kind of getting depressed yet? (laughs) He's nicknamed the weeping prophet because his life was so difficult. In fact, there's a place where he talks about 
there's this unceasing flow, this stream that comes from my eyes. Now, when he's 65-ish, so 45 years after he started as a prophet, there's a book that is written, and many people believe, me included, not everybody, it's not widely agreed across the board, but many people believe Jeremiah wrote this book. It's a little book in the Bible. It's called Lamentations. The word lament is this passionate expression of grief and sorrow. That's the book he writes. Five chapters, five poems, and most of them are an acrostic. There were 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so you'll see if you ever look at Lamentations. Chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 all have 22 verses. The first uh, three, 1, 2, and, and 4, have uh, one for each letter of the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3, however, is different. Now, that's the introduction of the sermon. So today we're going to look at Lamentations chapter 23. <laughs> so if you want to turn there in your Bible or device, Lamentations chapter 3 is, is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. Lamentations chapter 3 is the longest chapter in this, this little book of these five poems. In fact, it's got three times as many verses, 66 verses. And again, you just see the hardship that Jeremiah has gone through. It starts off this way, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1. He says, I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. I, this, I, my life, I don't know if you ever watched the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, it's this classic, not classic, but a, a very uh, creative remake of, was it the Iliad or, or the Odyssey? Okay, the Odyssey. In that movie, the Soggy Bottom Boys sing this song, I am a man of constant sorrows. You read the lyrics of that song, it's like Jeremiah wrote it. I mean, everything that's going through, he says, I'm a man of affliction. I've gone through this. I mean, later in, in verse 14, he says, I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. Two things stick out to me on that one. One, he says, I'm the laughing stock, not of all the people, of my people. Now, I care about these people. I love these people. These are, I'm one of them. These are my people. It's not just the, the foreign nations. I would get that. But it's supposed to be the people of God. And they mock me. Not only do they mock me, but look at this. He said, they mock me in song all day long. They're making up songs to sing about him. I mean, it's like he dated Taylor Swift or something, that after the fact, they're making up these songs to sing about him. And he says, these songs just put me down and they just ridicule me. And then in verse 17, he says this. I've been deprived of peace. My life has been nothing but turmoil. I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. Don't give me this health, wealth, and prosperity thing by walking in obedience. I don't know anything about that. I'm not here for the good time. I'm here for a long time. So I say, my splendor is gone. Any kind of reputation I ever would have had, any kind of noble standing as a prophet, any kind of integrity, my name, my character, nothing there. And worse yet, not only is my splendor gone, but all that I had hoped from the Lord. All the things that I thought. When he said that I was going to be a prophet, to the nations and that I would tear down and build up. The things I imagined that would be. These aren't just hopes that I came up with. All my hopes from the Lord. Years ago, Philip Yancey wrote a book entitled Disappointment with God. And whether or not we're honest enough to express those, I'm sure that some of us have gone through those times. Like, God... It's just disappointment here. So it goes on, verse 19. Verse 19, it says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. The memories just flood into my mind of all of my life. I look back at 65, and all I can think about, and I remember them so well, is the hardships, the bitterness, the affliction, the wandering, all this stuff. Psychologists talk about a, uh, a cognitive bias called um, uh, a rosy uh, like recollection or um, uh, retrospection, rosy retrospection. It, it's kind of the nostalgia effect. That as we look back, as we get farther from an event, 
We think back of things in more positive terms than they actually were. The good old days. We forget how bad the good old days actually were. Because the bad things kind of go away, but the good things rise to the surface. And those are the things that we remember, and maybe we even exaggerate them a little bit. Jeremiah does not suffer from that delusion at all. He says, I look back, and they've been bad old days the whole way through. I remember it all the way. So much so that at the very core of my being, I'm downcast in my soul. Now, I wanted you to get a picture of Jeremiah's life. I mean, if, when you see him in heaven, you better high-five this guy. I mean, after all he's gone through, after all he did, and even in the midst of all that, he writes these four verses that are absolutely amazing, like an oasis of hope in a massive desert of despair. These four verses that just, in my mind, cause him to rise even higher in my esteem of him. These four verses that allowed him to have hope even in the troublesome reality. These four verses that are not just for Jeremiah, but they're for us as well. These are the four verses that you came for today. These are the four verses I think that are maybe the most important out of this whole series that we can hold on to because when we have these four verses, we can overflow with hope no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation, no matter what we go through. Here we go. You ready for these four? Verse 21, he says, with everything else that's happened, what we've just gone through, 21, yet, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. That word yet this is the turning point. This is when the, the boxer who's beat to a pulp rises up off the mat, off the canvas with a fire in his eyes, and you know the whole story is turning here. This is the yet when things change. This is the yet where it was going this way, but, and he turns it the other way. This is what Habakkuk does in Habakkuk chapter 3, if you're familiar with that, where he says, man, our world is rough. There, there's no grapes, there's no figs, there's no olives, there's no crops in the field, there's no sheep in the barn, there's no cattle in, 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 the, in, the, in the field, there, nothing, we got nothing, yet will I rejoice in the Lord, yet. It's what Karl Barth, the theologian, called the defiant nevertheless. Yes, this is all going on, this is my reality, but in defiance to that, there's a nevertheless. A couple years ago, you know, I mentioned my mom, you met her. A couple years ago, she had a knee replacement. She's in her 80s. She's got her health breaking down. Her husband's got dementia. And all Things were going rough. And she said, Bob, you know what my word for the year is? Nevertheless. Nevertheless. To hold on to that. Yet. Nevertheless. And he says, this I call to mind. The memories come flooding in. You passive on that one. He says, this one is an act of discipline. This is something that I am going to intentionally refocus, redirect my attention to, reset my eyes on. These things I call to mind, and because I do that, in the midst of everything else, therefore I have hope. So what is it that he calls to mind? What does he redirect his eyes to? What does he put his focus on? It's not some platitude, oh, the sun will come out tomorrow. It's not that kind of thing. Turn that frown upside down, little camper. It's going to be okay. It's not that at all. He doesn't deny everything that's going on. In fact, he's just filled with all this lament because of it. But what he does is he has a hopeful perspective despite the circumstances. Because if you continue to read his life, the circumstances don't change. It doesn't have a wonderful ending in his life here on earth. It continues on. It's very difficult. What he does is he sets his eyes and pulls to his mind something that transcends his circumstances, something that's above. And this is why this is so important for us. Because you don't have to be a prophet of God, chosen from birth, to do what he did. This is how we can have hope. There are three non-changing, eternal truths that he sets his mind on and causes him to have hope. These three truths are absolutely profound, but they're not new. They're not mysterious. You're not going to be going, oh, I've never really thought about that. In fact, they have nothing to do with our circumstances. They transcend those. And these are the three truths that I want us to call to mind, especially when we're in the troublesome 
realities of life. Here we go. First one is God's unceasing love. God's unceasing love. This is what Jeremiah says. Everything's gone around. People hate me. They write songs about me. They ridicule me. They beat me up. They put me in prisons and sludge pits and they get all this stuff, death threats. But you know what I know always is there, nothing ever changes, is that God loves me. That I will call to mind. That's a reality no one can take away from me. And it's not based on my circumstances. I think years later, Paul would remind us of this in Romans chapter 8 when he says, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then he asks another question. What could ever separate us from the love of God? Can, can troubles or hardship or persecution, a famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquered. For I'm convinced, convinced, that not even death or life, angels or demons, the present or the future, height nor depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. See, you and I can always call this to mind. Here's how Jeremiah writes it down. Jeremiah 3.22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It doesn't ride the wave of our circumstances. That's what we think. We think if things are going good, oh, God must be pleased with me. I'm receiving the favor of God. Things are going good. God must not like me anymore. He must be hateful toward me and whatever. And we think that's how his love goes. No, God's love has nothing to do with our circumstances. Our circumstances are not a reflection or an indication of the level of God's love in our life. His love is unceasing. It's steadfast. Again, out of Romans, in Romans chapter 5, Paul writes, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Yeah, yeah, that's what we like. Hope, glory of God. But look what else he says. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Wait a second. Eh, hold on. Easy there, big fella. What do you mean we rejoice in our sufferings? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit, which he's given to us, his love. Jeremiah would write in 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Call this to mind, and you'll have hope. The second thing is God's new mercy, his new mercy. You know, <laughs> I talk about being from the South. Whenever there was something that we're going through, you know, my dad used to say, mercy, mercy. Kind of a shortened, Lord have mercy. He does. He does have mercy. Jeremiah would have been very familiar with the Psalms. One of the common categories of Psalms are Psalms of Lament. You really think Jeremiah would not have taken advantage of the psalms of lament in the difficulties of his life? He would have prayed those, and he would have sung those songs. He was also probably very familiar with that psalm that's most familiar to us, where it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Micah, the prophet, says that God delights to show mercy. This is what Jeremiah writes. He says, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. They just keep going. Now, I just need to apologize for those of you who are a little bit hungry right now, because this, in my mind, just comes to food. His mercies never come to an end like, like all you can eat, like the bottomless fries at Red Robin, like that occasionally when Olive Garden does the endless pasta bowl. It just... <laughs> I'm getting amens, and no one else preaches, it says amen about the Lord, but food, come on, hallelujah. Red Lobster just filed bankruptcy. Why? Because they lost $11 million on their never-ending shrimp. But when, <laughs> Preach it, brother. Let's have a potluck. But when it comes to the mercies, they are never-ending. It's like an all-you-can-eat that never stops. And they're new, it says, they are new every morning. I wonder if Jeremiah had in mind this idea about the manna that God provided for the people in history. Every morning, a fresh supply. You can't save it from yesterday, it'll be putrid. You can't take it into tomorrow, it won't work. It's every day. And Jesus would pray, give us this day 
It's our, it's our daily allotment. That his mercies are brand new. And as Jeremiah was there in the stocks, as Jeremiah was there in the dungeon, as Jeremiah was there in the sludge pit, every day he would call to mind, God's mercy is seeing me through this. His mercies are new today. This morning when you got up, his mercies were brand new. There are no day-old donuts with the mercy of God. Every morning you ought to wake up and say, mmm, that smells like fresh from the oven of heaven. Brand new mercies for today. Unending. You know, fix your mind on that. He says, these are the things I call to mind. The third one is God's great faithfulness. His great faithfulness in all of the difficulties and we, many of us sang, grew up singing, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That's what he says. Great is, great is your faithfulness. In all things, God will be faithful. See, it's nothing new, but it's incredibly profound when we feel despair and hopeless, we can call these things to mind and have hope. God's love is unceasing. His steadfast love never ends. His mercies are never ending. They're new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. Now, real quick, not only does he call it to mind, but he says it as well. Verse 24, he says this. He said, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. I say to myself, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, too often we listen to ourselves when we ought to be talking to ourselves. Instead of listening to our feelings, we ought to tell our feelings. He says, I say to myself, and the, the English standard version says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. This brings us full circle to where we started eight weeks ago. That if we're going to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not just what we hope for, it's who we hope in. What we hope for is the circumstances, it's the outcomes, and they may or may not change. Who we hope in is the source, it's Jesus, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love is unceasing, his mercies are new every morning, he is faithful to the very end. The psalmist writes in Psalm 42, why are you downcast, O my soul? He's talking to himself. I love when we sing that song, Gratitude, when it talks about, you know, watch out, soul, don't go getting shy on me. You know the song I'm talking about. It's like we're talking to our soul. He's done, doing the same thing. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? And soul probably says, I'll tell you why. See what we're going through? You know what's happening? You have unanswered prayers, the hardships, the difficulties. He says, okay, fine. This is what you need to do, soul. You put your hope in God. Because this is what I'm doing. It's what we're doing. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. It's not just what you hope for. It's who your hope is in. So you hold unswervingly. You hold unswervingly in your singleness. You hold unswervingly in your marriage. You hold unswervingly in your family. You hold unswervingly in the pain and in the suffering. Unswervingly in your doubts and in your faith. Unswervingly in your clarity, in your confusion. Holding unswervingly in every area of life, good and bad. Life isn't always easy. But this you can call to mind and therefore have hope. God's love, His mercies, His faithfulness, overflowing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Live in that hope. Those three truths will serve us well 